Gentlemen, ladies, aliens, start your engines as the Seconds Out Live starts again this week. I'm Eamon Khan here with my good friend, Donna Corby. Donna, I feel a little bit weird. Should I not be on the left as the A-side here? You've suddenly come in and put yourself in as the A-side. What's this all about? I am the A-side. I'm clearly the boxing knowledge of this duo. Um, my microphone works just fine. There was no problems. You didn't just see me unmute myself right there. That was actually great broadcasting. And uh, yeah, I'm the A-side. So uh, welcome to Seconds Out Live. I'm your host, Donna Corby. And uh, my guest today is Eamon Khan. That's right. That's right. We've changed things up a little bit. Make sure, though, the format stays the same. If you haven't already, click the like button, hit subscribe, get your comments, get your questions in as we react to quite a lot of boxing that's gone o on over the last few days. We'll be selecting a few things, uh, specifically more so stuff in the UK, um, especially with last night's offering uh, on Sunday of all days as well, too, leading in from some of the big games and football. He was Man City versus Arsenal. Boxer decided to go on the, sun on the Sunday with a really good card, to be fair. I said last week that when it comes down to it with the promoters, they like to throw out the stacked card, stacked card um, phrasing. I don't think it was quite a stacked card, but a good card indeed still, headlined by Fabio Wardley defending his British and Commonwealth heavyweight titles against Fraser Clark. Um, I was there in attendance. A little bit difficult sometimes when you're working a show because you have to be back and forth, uh, getting interviews as such and doing your work as, as you're trying to keep tabs on the fight. So I couldn't quite see the full uh, fight unfold before my before my eyes from ringside. So I had to kind of come in and dip in every now and again. But from what I saw, it seemed to be quite a brutal affair between the two, which swung in momentum as both fighters tied up points and some as well landing some heavy hits on the other. Wardley seemed to have that edge in power when he was able to drop Fraser Clark, who at times had to use his experience and now maybe that he'd gathered and gained through the amateur scene, uh, gaining that bronze medal, had to kind of hold on to stop and stifle Wardley from landing maybe that finishing blow. But he did manage to do that, and he did man manage to rest the tide for a bit as Wardley tied, especially in the eighth round. Wardley put a lot into that, and that, that, that real white collar background it's a bit frustrating to still hear about water being referred to as that because he's won that british title so that legitimizes you so it's a good tagline to have the white collar scene come in but that's really kind of been gone and uh, gone and done now but Wardy was maybe the epitome here at this level of being able to bite down on the gum shield and throw back when he seemed to be on the ropes and uh, fire back to fraser who was really pinning him down, using all his leverage and and weight to really kind of uh, wear down Wardley. But the fight was went the full distance, and it was scored a draw. You got the sense and feeling with the way the fight went, and then the way the scorecards were read out that this might be something where both fighters would have their hand raised. I've spoken a lot, don't know. Whilst people uh, populate their opinions in the chat, what did you think about the fight? Yeah, I thought uh, it was obviously one of the better British boxing fights we've seen in, in a long time in terms of the entertainment value, in terms of everything that was was going on in and around it. There was a great build. There was a great undercard. I, I was actually more excited going into it for the Vidal Riley fight than uh, Mikel Awada than I was for the main event. But these guys delivered in a huge way. Fabio Wardley is one of those guys, I guess because of that background you're talking about, where you you constantly would bet against him all the time. And he's not a guy you should be betting against, but I, I, I think I wasn't sure about him and Adelaide. I wasn't sure how that was going to go. I remember Adelaide being a big underdog and thinking that was a, a great bet. Uh, Nathan Gorman was, was going to be a tough fight until it actually really wasn't that much. And, you know, they, I, I think he's one of those guys who I guess you don't give, like, the, the requisite respect to. Um, but, yeah, he, he, did, uh, he did brilliant. And so did, so did Fraser Clark. You know, he put down... Uh, Clark, and then obviously you had the point deduction in the seventh round as well. A lot of excitement, and, and people were really buzzing for it. And I think there is appetite for a rematch, despite what some of the guys you were speaking to were saying. Yeah, what do you think about the idea of a rematch? Because, I mean, it's got the draw uh, Fabio does. There's no rematch clause as far as we're aware. There wouldn't be for the champion and mandated uh, belt. But Fabio maybe didn't see it well. He seemed to say that at least from the post-fight interviews, I saw that maybe he'd be open to one. But really, when it comes to the heavyweight division and riches outside of the UK right now, in Saudi Arabia, where Fabio Wardley has 
fought before winning the belt against David Adelaide. Maybe look to that sort of scene and push on uh, from this kind of level right now. It seemed to see, it seemed to be that he kind of was saying in the lead up uh, to the fight that he's kind of done at this level and wants to move on. So maybe the process for Fabio next is to, you know, heal up and then look to vacate the title and look forward to some of the bigger fights around European level and further. But do you, do you feel you will get that rematch done? Yeah, look, I personally would like to see it. I, I can understand why he would want to move up, especially after getting out to Saudi and getting that payday and now having this big fight in the O2. And, and certainly, if I'm Turkey Al Sheikh and I'm watching that, I'm thinking, yeah, let's get that rematch like tomorrow. Let's get that on the Fury card on May 18th. Let's just, these guys are, are fit. They've just done, you know, the, the, the a fight of that magnitude. Let's just get them back out again. Get them on that Bivol fight maybe or something. And, and I, I think... I would imagine Turkey Al Sheikh would want to see that fight again. But yeah, if, if I'm Fabio Wardley as well, what is he, 17, 18 fights into his pro career at this stage? Is he 17, 0 and 1, so 18 fights in? Uh, I think that he's, yeah, he would want to be moving up the levels. And look, like he, there are guys he could definitely beat, even if he skipped the kind of the European level, if he went straight to like a Jarrell Miller type of guy or, or you know, that, that kind of level, there are guys he could beat around there. Uh, so I think there's definitely options for him. Yeah, and, and just going into the actual fight as well, too, it, in the sense of how exciting it was and probably the best British heavyweight title fight since Anti Joshua versus Dylan White, uh, which was a very good fight, I think, back in 2014 and 15. I feel like something for me that Boxer probably needed and amongst all the noise and amongst all the competition and amongst all the movements that are happening outside, outside in Saudi Arabia, Boxer have kind of stuck to kind of wanting to deliver these domestic card fights and wanting to deliver for UK British fans. So for a heavyweight fight of that magnitude between Wardley and Clark, who I think Wardley has been exciting. Clark hasn't been as exciting. So this could and had the, all the makings of potentially being a stinker, but it wasn't. And I think that's probably a big, one of the bigger W's over the weekend because Box were able to deliver on a platform. Though I don't know, smilingly, I have to say one of the big W's. One of the big wins, if you're happy for me to say it in its unabbreviated form, Dunner. But maybe this is something Boxer needed with the gamble to put this on a Sunday in the lead up to Man City versus Arsenal and get those viewership in, that rising viewership. They needed this to be a, a real good fight, and it was. Yeah, I remember asking people why it was on Sunday instead of Saturday, and they were saying, oh, because the football and everything else. And, and uh, I mean, it couldn't have delivered more between someone like Vidal Riley who kind of bridges the gap with that kind of younger audience. And, he, I mean, that performance wasn't fantastic, but then it builds into this big heavyweight showdown and you get the guy going down and then having to come back up and all this this great fight. So, yeah, it certainly uh, it delivered for Boxer. And, uh, and I think... Maybe not next. Maybe there'll be some some movement around. I think before both of these guys have hung up their gloves, they'll have settled this dispute down the line. So just getting into some of the comments from uh, posts right, uh, on Boxers uh, Twitter, Fabio Wardley mentioned that the rematch is an option, but there are different things out there for me. So I completely get that from Fabio's point of view. Um maybe not wanting to immediately put himself into a position for a rematch, especially when he doesn't have to. But but, but as well, you kind of elevate yourself as well, don't you, when you give in such a performance that people want to see not only you fight again, but also that fight again too. And it also opens up, when you do that fight in the O2 arena, maybe you can kind of big it up a little bit more. And he's looking for that Ipswich fight. I don't know how much uh, Ipswich Town Stadium fight. I don't know how much the Ipswich football ground holds. But when you're looking for that sort of, um, date uh, and when you had it was interesting really as well too we're in London and, and look London and Burton Fraser Clark is in exactly that sort of area but Fraser's kind of been working or or known to that that sort of area with all, all the more established fighter uh, a lot of fans in there for Fabio Wardley than there were for Fraser Clark maybe that's because of the footballing background as well too so uh, yeah for, uh, in, in the whole Fabio Wardley not quite attaching himself to a rematch in full Dave Colwell on Twitter was saying, felt privileged to watch these two warriors go at it last night. Boxing is a sport that can be the ultimate test of willpower and character. How far are you prepared to take yourself? Abby Wall and Big Fraser, Fraser Clark showed just how special this sport can be. Definitely one of those special nights as well, too, which again adds to one of those reasons why you might want to see uh, 
this fight again. Fabio Wardley also said too in the post-fight press conference <laughs> because he was so marked up, um, bruised eye, he was cut, he was bloodied. And we've seen this before in the Nathan Gorman fight where when he's put in those positions, he answers back, he bites back. Uh, the nose seems to be a recurring bit of an issue for uh, Fabio, but it's, I don't think it's like the nose bleeding outwardly in the traditional sense. It's like on top of the nose or like the bridge of the nose, which is kind of uh, unique in a sense. But Fabio was saying that during through the fight, like he was happy to be entertaining, but he was also worried about what his mum would think about the fight when his mum would see him um, after the fight. Uh, CR19 in, in the chat says, no way, Wardley fighting a May, that injury needs sorting. And yeah, that leads down to it. When you've got an injury like that, maybe if you had plans uh, to fight over in Saudi Arabia, something like that needs proper healing and arresting and uh, might curtail any need for, uh, or any want, sorry, or desire to have a fight uh, as quick as something in a, in, in a recent few weeks time. Danny Gorfillan asking, Danny, good to see you. Where's Josh? Who's Josh? Don't know who this Josh character is. We've got Donna Corby. Um, <laughs> By the way, it's CR 91, not 19. you got to show some respect to our chatters. And Danny Gilfill and uh, I look forward to our rematch very did soon. You, did I say CR19? Yeah. Oh, wow. It's uh, one of those boxing... Well, not boxing day. What am I about? Bank holiday hangovers, I yeah. guess. That's one of those things. But it was good to see as well, too, um, that... <laughs> There was, a, there was a little bit of jeopardy, wasn't there? I don't know, I don't know if you saw this story that um, half the ring got stolen. What? Yeah, do you not see this? I, I think I vaguely read something about it. I, I had a busy weekend. Yeah, so what happened was um, the the ring crafting team, um, I believe their van was stolen uh, <laughs> during the fight week and half the ring was contained in that van. So and there was a kind of a couple of memes going around of Matchroom, the Matchroom <laughs> team coming in and stealing the van, <laughs> but they managed to find or locate another ring, so the fight could go ahead. But imagine, could you imagine the sight of uh, those fighters fighting in half a ring? Yeah, that's what they would do. Instead of canceling the fight, they would do a half a ring fight. That would be awesome. They should do that more often. I mean, these. I mean, you watch those misfits fights; they're pretty much done in half a ring, aren't they? Well, I don't know about those misfits. Well, half a ring, <laughs> an extra opponent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or maybe not. <laughs> someone being swatted. What? What was? What yeah. happened in that event? Don't know. Oh, I don't know. It was too much to get into on here. But uh, yeah, they, they had a two versus one, and then one of the guys decided five minutes before that he wasn't going to show up. He had an anxiety attack, which obviously is serious, but uh, it, it's like bad when you're backstage and you're all gloved up and everything. Like he had the wraps on, and his gloves had been like signed off and everything. And then he decided, oh, no, actually, I can't do it. So the other fellow had to go out on his own. And he just decided, basically, right, if I'm in any danger at all, I'm just going to go down and <laughs> get the 10 count. So it was a very strange event and uh, and a very small ring, too. Just to wrap up on uh, Wardley Clark specifically, for Fraser Clark, from being from the Olympic background, bronze medalist as well, to do you feel that he answered some of the critics, some of the doubters that he has about his ability and translating over into the professional game i think of himself he's kind of admitted that you know he hasn't really shown the true form of himself in the ring just yet but with the performance against wardley and the, the way he fought back as well too do you feel that he's got that future in the division um going forward yeah no i thought he i thought i thought he, he performed pretty well obviously he turned over a little later than you usually would um which is fine but uh yeah i, I thought it was one of his better performances obviously he he did very well against uh, Dave Allen as well, but um, yeah, he, he basically yeah he 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 answered a, a lot of questions. He had to you know um, he had to get up off the canvas, and and that's obviously something that that shows in in the in the pro game. So yeah, I, I thought it was uh, a strong showing from both guys, Fabio Wardley and Fraser Clark. If they didn't find the ring, they could just fight in the leisure center with no lights. Yep. Maybe they could do that too. Um, yeah, just quickly as we move on to the next uh, point, uh, Donna, you mentioned about uh, Vidal Riley winning the, oh, sorry, defeating uh, Mikel Lawal. Mikel Lawal, look, uh, no, no mug at the level, uh, but Vidal kind of really stopped him, stifled him, made, made him miss, made him pay. That was kind of the MO and really kind of mm -hmm. boxed to a plan there, which is what he was kind of saying afterwards. Didn't do any media afterwards either. There's belief that maybe apparently he had an 
injury, which is why he didn't want to speak at that time. Um, but were you suitably impressed by Vidal? Yeah, I mean, I think Vidal is is one of the best British prospects out there, and obviously. He, he uh, his his ability to transition between the there's kind of like two boxing audiences in the UK and 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 in America and stuff and I think that he is his ability to be one of those guys who jumps between the two where obviously all of the influencer type people know him because of his connections with KSI but then he is a legitimate top prospect and a legitimate cruiserweight and, and we saw that on Saturday night he wasn't in any danger at all and that's not because Michaela Wall is, is any um, you, you know, any any walkover or anything. But he's not probably as exciting as he needs to be. I liked the little face-off he had afterwards, but otherwise, yeah, I think uh, I think we need... Uh, I mean, it's tough, though, because he said, like, oh, we need more knockouts or whatever. He's fighting at a very competitive level in a very, very competitive cruiserweight division. So I wouldn't be expecting big knockouts from uh, from Vidal Riley if I'm one of the, the youngsters crossing over. Expect good technical boxing and something very, very different than you would see on the shows you're used to if you're a, a Misfits guy. Next on the card for topic of discussion is, well, we were hoping to be discussing some form of fight or announcement or, and that was what was teased on this card to a degree from the whispers within the media. There was going to be some form of big announcement uh, to be made on this uh, boxer card headlined by Ward Lee and Clark. Um, and that would be to regards us to the next steps for Adam Azim, who's there's a lot of noise outside of Adam Azim making any noise right now in terms of the other side of the coin where the European, uh, the EBU, sorry, have ordered Adam Azim to defend his title against Dalton Smith. At purse bids are coming very, very soon. But the, the feeling is from Dalton Smith's side, Matchroom side, or Eddie Hearn more specifically, is that Adam Azim doesn't want any part of uh, Dalton Smith right now, or at least his team don't, or boxer don't right now. They don't want to engage in that, and they just want Adam Zim and his team to vacate that title so Dalton Smith can, as they say, take a few steps back if they need to, to fight Adam Zim or fight for that European title. Maybe kind of a bit of a PR battle there, which they're winning whilst Dalton Smith looks forward as opposed to backwards as he did against uh, Jose Zapita, beating him in brutal fashion with a great body shot. But what we saw was a stylish English Chris Eubank senior uh, walk his nephew to the ring, uh, Harlem Eubank. Uh, I believe it was, uh, I think it was in the ring. I didn't quite see it. But either way, the announcement that was made was that Adam Azim and Harlem Eubank are in advanced talks. Not quite what we were looking for in terms of a fight being announced, but advanced talks is the stage. So a bit of a uh, something of nothing. But it means that at least uh, maybe some of the talks surrounding a fight between Azim and Smith can be silenced for now. And that fight's for later down in the future. Uh, first, thing, I'm going to come to you, Donna, just about, not about the fight specifically, but Chris Eubank Sr. being in the corner for his nephew Harlem Eubank, it's kind of brought more of a spotlight and shine to Harlem, which I think that's what... Uh, Chris Eubank Sr. does with his profile. He did that with his son, Eubank Jr. Eubank Jr. and 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 his father aren't quite linked up anymore as they used to be. But does Eubank Sr. being in the corner for Harlem Eubank bring him more of that profile, make you want to see him more because of the package that uh, Eubank Sr. brings? Yeah, bro. I, th I think definitely it's... It, 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 you get someone like Eubank Sr. around and, and the media flock to him, the fans flock to him. People love this guy. He's one of the most beloved figures in British boxing, all of boxing, just such a character. And and look, like Harlem is not necessarily a character like that. Obviously, Chris Jr. is a character in his own way. He's very different to his dad, but actually quite similar in, in, in a lot of ways, but just not the uh, the same type of guy. And, and I think that he does add that huge PR presence. And certainly, I don't think if he was not involved, because he wasn't involved for a while, right? Like, Harlem was doing just fine without him. But if he wasn't involved, I don't think they're doing this Adam Azim fight right now. And it does seem like the talks are ongoing. But then I, I went on Sky Sports website just before we started this to, to read up. They, they had an article. The article disappeared. It's gone. So uh, I think uh, there's still some some movement to be made there. But yeah, I, I think, does he get the... I don't know, him. What do you reckon? Does he get the Adam Azim fight without the PR that comes with Eubank Sr. being there? I think uh, with Eubank Senior in the corner, I think it kind of tilts the the scales towards that fight, especially as they don't seem to have their interest right now in 
the Dalton Smith fight. The argument that they'll make is that because of the Eubank name, because of the buzz that Eubank Senior brings and the, the heritage that he has from being a former fighter and the pizzazz around him as well too, the showmanship mm. that he brings to that's going to bring the spotlight to to that fight. And that remains to be seen. I don't really have quite a scope on that right now. Um, you know, you, you hear the Channel 5 figures and stuff and you hear that, you know, Harlem Eubank is getting great viewership. And he, he did, he did, I was there in Brighton and he did look like a star with Eubank Senior posing uh, to the side of him as well in those kind of like Jimmy Hart wrestling kind of <laughs> manager sort of role there. He did, did bring something more to him, but... Is it a bigger fight right now? No. The, the truth of the matter is, like, it's a trade fight either way, but more so because you add Eubank Senior into the mix and the Eubank name, it might translate more so to casual fans. But I don't know how much of that effect has on right now when Harlem Eubank does, doesn't yet have the profile that is probably needed or or, or, may, or maybe that they think that he has right now. He's only I, just had that link up. So I don't actually think it makes much of a material difference. Maybe it will on the viewership if they look to split it and with Channel 5 or Sky or whatever it is. Uh, I um, guess if, if they're not looking to fight Dalton Smith, which it appears they're not, and it doesn't appear the boxer are too interested in working with Matchroom. They clearly don't like purse bids very much. I, I think... They uh like they 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 want to do their own thing and and they'll work with other promoters maybe but they're they're not too keen on on matchroom so yeah and and Harlem just emerges then as a next guy on that path and and he becomes a bigger name because of Eubank Senior and and you know it's it's funny you mentioned the Jimmy Hart thing because he is actually I mean it's funny, like people for people remember how great he was in the ring but he really was more known for. It, I guess it was a perfect blend of everything, but he is such a Jimmy Hart type of guy. He's a, a great uh, advocate, a manager, uh, and I think he he really does bring so much to Harlem. And I'm sure there's part of the stuff in the gym that he brings as well. Like He's still one of the great British boxers of all time and, and has this phenomenal mind for fighting and for you know the, the, the art of, of war and everything. And, and I think that's a big factor. So yeah, it, it certainly makes that a more appetizing fight, but it is such a typical, like it, they had a big USC event on over the weekend and, and an MMA fan would say this is the kind of like fights like this are like the problem with boxing because the fight is Dalton Smith. Hmm. That's the one that it makes sense. But because there isn't like a huge clamor for it, because there isn't that big of an audience, they're going to try to maneuver it around and, and they're going to try to finagle something else. But the, the, the truth of the matter is it shouldn't be Harlem Eubank. It should be Dalton Smith in that position. Yeah, I mean, I sort, I sort of, I get both sides of the argument, and I was saying last week that, you know, I, I don't kind of see right now the clamor for Azim and Smith. I, I don't think really many boxing fans are outside of the trade are calling for this fight. But the same can be said really for Azim and Eubank. Just getting cl clarification on it, um, on an article on Boxing News, um, Shane McGuigan has said it's done, it's signed, it's sorted. We're waiting to just to uh, announce the venue and the date, but the fight is signed for sure. So there's confirmation there unless something crazy happens that that fight is next. So we imagine as a consequence then that Adam Azim will be vacating his European title um, and we'll see what Dalton Smith does as to whether he looks to fight for that European title. I, don't, uh, I imagine that he won't um, and other contenders will come into the frame there. Um, but yeah, that seems to be the, the course of action right now. And it will be Azim versus uh, Eubank, whether it be in London or Brighton is another uh, question. Uh, and by the way, you, you kind of giggled when I said that boxer don't like purse bids. That's not like a wild thing to say. They don't like them, do they? Well, <laughs> they've had some previous in the past with Wardley Clark as well too, haven't they? And that's uh, they decided not to go forward with that one. They pulled, uh, or, well, Depends on the side of the coin here, but either way, Wardley, sorry, Clark was pulled out of the uh, purse bids. They wanted another fight. They got that other fight, and they feel that now Clark was ready. He got the draw. Uh, maybe another night he might have uh, had that uh, victory. But yeah, they've, there has been that previous beforehand with the purse bids. Um, but it seems like for now, whilst the noise from Eddie Hearn has gone on in the background, uh, they won't be entering these purse bids and. Uh, 
we'll be moving on in a different direction. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it will be Azim versus Eubank uh, next. Moving on to our next point of contention. And before I actually do, let me know in the comments as well too. We'll read them back out on the next week's show as to whether you feel that Dalton Smith was the right course of action next for Adam Zim or you're happy with the Harlem Eubank fight and the pizzazz surrounding Harlem Eubank too in the form of Chris Eubank Sr. Moving on to the next point is a very interesting little promo. I do love a promo in boxing. There should be more of them. I know that... Some of them have been filtering in through and they've been really good when it comes to advertising Saudi Arabian fight nights. Joe Parker has been doing his own promos and he did quite a few during lockdown. And in this promo, I think is it is I want you back for good. Is that Backstreet Boys? <laughs> take that. It's take that. Yeah. Maybe I'm thinking I want it my way. I it's... want you back for good. That's take that. It makes me sick that you don't know that. It's a British classic, the greatest band to come out of Manchester. Take that, wrote that song, and and uh, you don't know that. It, it really, Eamon, your lack of knowledge on the boy bands disgusts me. That's why I'm on the left slide this time, because you don't left even know right. anything about boy bands. You know what? I've, uh, boy bands aren't quite my thing, Dunner. Uh, I'd much prefer girl bands, actually. That's true. Yeah, and I've been listening to a lot of uh, rock music as well recently. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, uh, I did not know that it was Take That. I thought it was uh, Backstreet Boys. Uh, but where the boys are looking to run it back. Joe Parker <laughs> wants to run it back in the form of a rematch with Dylan White. He pulled out some sort of uh, amusing picture with Dylan White in uh, interesting attire. But the point is, Joe Parker, <laughs> who's been on somewhat of a resurgence a climb back to the top with some really good performances after he was stopped by joe joyce he's now on the climb back culminating in the last fight against Zile Zhang. we had to climb back up off the canvas and win on points which is kind of a bit of a metaphor of joe parker's career in recent years but joe parker now wants to rectify one of the losses in his career and i think this was his first loss wasn't it no second loss might be um after anti joshua uh, he wants Dylan White. What do you think about that fight, Corby? I think it's a great fight, but it's a weird step in a weird direction for Joseph Parker. I guess he's Tyson Fury's teammate. He's one of his close friends, and he's not moving towards fighting for a title anytime soon. As far as he's concerned, the titles are all pretty much wrapped up, right? Like Fury's going to fight Usyk, and then they're going to rematch, and he's presuming that Fury wins both of those. So then Fury's going to fight AJ, and they'll probably rematch Parker's probably thinking, I don't have four more Tyson Fury fights. Like, that's years of time. Could be three years to do four Tyson Fury fights. So he probably thinks, I don't have three years. And he wants to kind of rectify the fights. And maybe the belts will get split up or something, and he'll be able to do that. But he'll probably be keen to get Dillian White, maybe even get Andy Ruiz. I know there's some dispute over over the the result of that one. Obviously went his way, but I think he he would want to to get that back. And, and, And then obviously Anthony Joshua will be the big one. That he wants to uh, to get back, so Joe Joyce as well, I'm sure, um, and maybe that's the route he's going down. Is like he instead of going for another world title run, he's maybe looking for looking to rectify the the results on his record because all of the losses that he has, and even that one with reason which he didn't lose, but a lot of people felt uh, didn't go his way. A lot of these fights are top top names that will make him a lot of money, especially if he's fighting in Saudi Arabia. But this is the thing, like. With the this run that he's going on, and also it seems to be if White is in the frame and he's looking to make that fight, that maybe means that, well, I guess it is the case now, isn't it? With while the Zhang being mooted, Zhang isn't going to be... We got, I guess, confirmation, I guess, or more so, uh, at least from the Joe Parker point of view. We had the one side of it where it's been mooted and rumoured that with, with White versus Zhang, there was that rematch clause. So we hadn't heard about that. So this must be kind of one of the final nails in the coffin that there's not going to be a rematch between Wilder and Zhang, at least not for now. And there probably doesn't need to be a rematch clause anyway in these contracts when um, over in Saudi, those fights can be made quite easily because the money's there, the fighters are there willing and wanting. But the other side of it really is like that Wilder and Zhang back-to-back wins, that's kind of in the, the mix of the heavyweight division right now. That is like a world title worthy um, two fights to put yourself in the picture for getting a world title opportunity, don't you think? No, absolutely. But that's what I'm saying is I think he's probably looking at 
the landscape of the division. And I guess he's maybe thinking he if he wants to win another world title, it would need to be when the belts get split up. And it, it, assuming that Fury fights Usyk and then they split the belts immediately once he wins, uh, or, or once whoever wins, they they split them immediately. And um and, and you know maybe he'd be looking. I guess his trajectory he'd be looking at is like if I can sneak in there against AJ again when the belts are splintered up, that's probably his best bet. Because it, it's a great run that he's on, beating Deontay Wilder, one of the best wins you can get in the division. Gile Zhang, one of the best wins you can get in the division. Both very impressive. Maybe even Zhang more impressive at this stage, given where he was. Um, and, and I think he's probably thinking, yeah, but I'm not going to fight Tyson Fury ever. And I'm probably not going to fight Alexander Usyk. Usyk has said before, he said before the uh, just after the AJ two fight that if he's not fighting Tyson Fury, he's hanging him up. And he fought Dubois in the end. But uh, I think Usyk is probably looking at these two Fury fights and thinking that's that's going to be it for me. So I'd I'd say Joseph Parker is at the moment concerned about making as as much money as he can and hoping that maybe a belt becomes available and he doesn't have to fight uh, Tyson Fury. So you had the opportunity to maybe watch Parker. Um you know, on the TV recently, but you had the opportunity to watch White in the comeback. It was only a few rounds, of course, against Christian Hammer, who wasn't all that interested, but who would be your money on if we got the rematch between the two? Um, yeah, I, I think that's a great question. That's a fantastic... Who's your money on? Probably Joe Parker right now, considering where Dylan's been out of the ring for a while, coming back against Christian Hammer. Um you know, got those three rounds in and against a Parker who's got that, who's found that form and really kind of gelling under, uh, under Andy Lee right now. They seem to just have, seem to click and seem to be able to bring out the best in Joe Parker. Mm -hmm. Joe, who, who's able to find fits and spurts in fights where even in his worst moments, he can find a way around those, navigate that, got that experience now under his belt. When Dylan White seems to lose his form, he loses his form and it's oh, usually. And certainly, if you're talking about, sorry to interrupt, but if you're talking about um, if they fought, for example, on the Fury Usyk undercard, like in, in six weeks, yeah, there's no way. Joseph Parker very, very comfortably wins that fight. Dylan White needs another run out first, and it, he needs a bit of time. And I don't know what Parker's situation is. Fought in December, just before that. Um, he, sorry, he fought in December, and then he fought on the uh, the AJ card as well. So he's he's active. He's super active. Um but I, I don't know what his plan of action is. It's certainly it, it, like the Dillian White that fought Christian Hamer. He'd tell you himself, that guy is not beating any of these top heavyweights. So he, he would need another run out, another proper run out. Obviously, uh, Hamer did not give the fight that they were looking for. Um, but yeah, I think I think he's going to have to look for... I, he'll, he'll need another run out. Uh, will it be in the UK? Maybe not. But if he can get another one maybe over here somewhere or... If, if the Saudis want to put him on a card and, and give him kind of a, a a lower level fight, a more winnable fight, that would work too. But yeah, certainly if they fought anytime soon, you'd have to go park. Just jumping back to the chat, uh, Jack Bateman says, was that a stupid question asked? Was it by? Or I can only see because there's a heart in the way. So was that a stupid question asked Amy Khan at the post presser with Fraser Clark? Uh, appreciate the question. I guess that's a question to, don't know, I don't, don't think you saw it, did you? Uh, well, I heard about it. I heard about it for sure. Um, and I watch everything you do, Eamon, so of course I saw it. But I think it was not a stupid question. I, I think this is a, this could be a whole segment of the show, is the, the Eamon Khan versus Ben Shalom uh, dispute. And I know Shalom is, is famously kind of icy with the media at times. And I think it was not the stupidest question ever. I don't think it was the best question you've ever asked or anything. But no, I think... It's fine. Like, would he have been considered to hang him up if he if he hadn't got the win? You, I guess that's like what you ask any fighter in their thirties about these fights is, is would it be game over? So I don't think it's a crazy question. And he didn't lose anyway, so I guess we'll never know. I guess uh, questions split opinion, um, and Ben Shalom is entitled to his opinion as well. Too maybe looking back at it, maybe not the right time to ask a question or as direct as it was. Uh, but I think in the, in the whole, really, maybe fair on the whole, but maybe not the right time. What's uh, also either. important to remember is that Ben Shalom did say beforehand, no AJ, no DAZN, no would he retire after the fight. So, you know, 
Well, on the point of Ben Shalom, um, as Ben Shalom uh, took umbrage to that, uh, I did request an interview with Ben Shalom post-fight, and after he, he uh, seemed to take umbrage with that, and Ben Shalom declined on that point. So we would have had that conversation uh, on camera, um, and we could have discussed that point. So I was very much keen to discuss that with Ben, uh, but he didn't want to in that point. So that's so up are, to him. Are that. you suggesting that perhaps Ben is like a coward of some description, or...? Absolutely not. Uh, I know you're trying to stoke the flames. Those <laughs> words uh, aren't coming out of my my mouth at all. But I would have liked the opportunity to speak to Ben and maybe clarify those points uh, with him. And yeah. he could maybe give his point of view as well, too. But that wasn't to be. And we move on. Uh, he said at another time. So we will at another time get that conversation. Oh, so it with... wasn't like he said, like, no, I'm not talking to you. He just said, like, not tonight. It's been a busy night. It's been a long night. That kind of thing. Uh Again, I suppose you're sort of like adding words into his mouth. His words were another time. So right. uh, we'll so find he, out. He when was that... annoyed with you. He didn't really want to he, he didn't want to do it right at that moment, but and look, maybe it is a bit of cowardice. I mean, I, I would I certainly would never call Ben Shalom a coward, but I think if you wanted to say that, uh <laughs> I would you it's fine if you do. I will pass <laughs> on that actually, and I'll have the conversation with him at another point. Uh, for sure. Ben's entitled to his opinion, as is Fraser, his team, and myself as well, too. And uh, we can all learn and move on from that point as well. So moving on as well to back to uh, the heavyweight division, um, back to Joe Parker and Dylan White. Um, either of these fighters for you capable of winning a world title? We sort of talked about Joe Parker and him having this run, uh, Wilder, um, Zhang, those two wins. Um, Joe Parker kind of may be someone who's proving that. But Dylan White was someone who was really looking for that opportunity. He was talking about the thousand days, wasn't he, before he got that opportunity, the WBC title. When it came down to it, it was a stunning end for Dylan White, whose dreams crushed in front of him through the hands of Tyson Fury. But do you feel that White right now, you know, once those belt fragments, you you got AJ in the mix, a, a great fight to run back. And they wanted to run that, back, uh, that fight back, didn't they, before Dylan White couldn't. Uh, take that fight forward. He's had to deal with uh, drug-related issues. Um, Alexander Usyk, an elite-level fighter, Tyson Fury, that those two have to fight and contest for the undisputed belts. But White in the picture, if he maybe gets the win over Joe Parker, would you put him as someone who can eventually at some day raise one of those world titles above his head? Uh, not on the basis of the Christian Hamer fight, but uh, I think... He, I, I think that Joseph Parker certainly is in the mix. And if you're beating Deontay Wilder, you're beating Jilei Zhang, you 100% are capable of beating Alexander Usyk, Tyson Fury. Well, he wouldn't fight Tyson Fury, obviously. But uh, yeah, I think you're you're in the mix. Dillian White, I think the, the moment may have passed him on that one. But then again, you know, I mean, I hate to say it because it's so cliched. It's so outrageously cliched. It's heavyweight boxing, right? So I guess... At any at any moment, like Dillian White could definitely knock out Alexander Usyk. Um, probably more. I mean, we saw him against Fury. He certainly can't knock out Fury. But there's there's a way that someone like Dillian White could hurt someone like Alexander Usyk. And and certainly when the belts get fragmented, it's anyone's game, um, which will happen, I believe, after the first Fury Usyk fight in May. I believe immediately once that fight has happened, it, they'll get fragmented. So yeah, I think Dillian White, no Joseph Parker, absolutely. Was wasn't it quite interesting because wasn't at one stage, Joe Parker supposed to be like a stand-in opponent if one a fight hadn't materialized. So they're talking about that, but then since they've talked about how they would never fight each other. So Fury White, right? I think it might have been, yeah. Yeah, he was going to jump. I think that that was a little bit of Tyson Fury chicanery. Right. I don't think that if Dillian White had not shown up to that fight, remember he didn't show up to the press conference. It was a very controversial build-up. There had been uh, issues in in the the purse bid and all of that stuff. It was just a very contentious build up. Dillian White had been the the top contender aside from that brief period for for months and months of years. He'd been the top contender aside from the brief uh, period when he was fighting Pavek. And so I think, yeah, that they were never. I I don't think that if Dillian White didn't show up, that Joseph Barker was going to jump in there and fight Tyson Fury. And if he was, it would have been a favor to Tyson that one time. I don't think they will fight each other. Really, no matter what, and I don't think Joseph Bark. I don't think that's what Joseph Barker is looking for right now. Is like I don't think before he hangs up his gloves, he has to fight Tyson Fury. Um, it's it, it wouldn't be a priority. Uh, Andy Lee would hate it, and I think um, it, it, it's just not something he's concerned with at the moment. He's able to make a lot of money doing these other fights, and uh, and not 
having to do that right now. All right, moving on as well to to a, another good card. This was over in America, and it ended in a bit of surprising fashion. Not, not as the fight materialized, but maybe as people had kind of thought it would materialize heading into the fight. It was the expectancy was supposed to be Tim Zhu versus Keith Thurman, which maybe never was or was, but Keith Thurman had to pull out the mix, and we'll see what the the future is for one time Keith Thurman, who was one time in the frame for Tim Zhu, but in step Sebastian Fundora. Sebastian Fundora, a very fun fighter, a very unique fighter too, given his frame, a massive frame, six foot five, at super welterweight. How he makes the weight, I don't know. Uh, but he's got he's got assets on assets on assets, and he was able to really kind of finally put them together and it was the jab that really kind of saw him through the fight as well as maybe uh, an, an unintentional elbow i think it was as well too which caused a gash on top of tim zoo's head which was bleeding into his eye blurring his vision which changed the tide of the fight and um fendora who was knocked out wasn't he last time around against brian mendoza mm -hmm. kind of a real bad loss for him because he'd kind of had a lot of it his own way uh in fights against like against good fighters as well too like said gallimore jorge cota uh what was ericsson lubin he really made a mess of ericsson lubin didn't he and he did the same sort of thing against tim zoo in a different way um with uh his variation and punches and he won a split decision victory over tim zoo the favorite in the fight and claimed the unified WBC and WBO super welterweight titles over in America. And now kind of puts himself in the frame for some really big fights. Errol Spence Jr. must be looking at that and thinking, it was a great fight against Tim Zhu. Now I've got to come back potentially against this big towering hulk of a fighter in uh, Sebastian Fundora. How the hell do I deal with that after uh, being beaten by Terence Crawford? But then as well... Sebastian Fundora mentioned in the post white interview that if he wanted to fight with Terence Crawford or Errol Spence or whatever it was, whatever comes next, look, he'll leave it to his team. But he wants that Terence Crawford fight. He wants to fight with one of the pound for pound best fighters. He wants to challenge himself against the likes of Terence Crawford. So all the right noises coming from uh, Sebastian Fundora, who's really asserted himself or reinsert himself in the mix of that division. Um, when he wasn't favoured to do so. Uh, where Tim Zhu kind of goes from this, uh, look, Tim Zhu, brave fighter, never looked like he was on the verge of quitting, never looked like um, that he wanted a way out of the fight, um, kind of had the confidence, kind of had the wherewithal as well too, to really kind of push and try uh, to get the victory. It was 112, 116, uh, 116, 112, 115, 113, 116, 112 as well too, twice. So, pretty close in the mix of things as well with what Tim Zhu had to go through as well to see the final uh, final bell. Uh, but he can come again. He's got that time to come again. PBC will obviously favour him as well too. So maybe they'll look to run back in the rematch down the line as well uh, for Tim. But I think the immediate thing is he's got to kind of rest up and make sure that I mean it was kind of... You know, things like that don't happen too often, do they? Really in the ring. So he can kind of count himself a little bit unlucky in that sort of sense, to have that happen. But he'll have to kind of, if he fights Fendora again, look for ways to avoid... Because he's just got <laughs> such a unique frame, hasn't he? With a, a big high body, those elbows, if you're ducking down, maybe it's, it's just destined for him to meet them. It's, it's a, wacky to watch. It really is wacky. At yeah. that weight, it's nuts. Um, it, it, it's Vegas believe like six foot five is like... That's a heavyweight size to be... And he's getting all the way down there. Fair play to him. And, and he really did great against uh, Tim. So I want to see a rematch whenever they they fancy doing it. That, that's what I think PBC would probably be pushing for. I mean, it looked like a huge big crowd in there at the T-Mobile Arena. Uh, even a, a friend of mine was there and, and they'd been given a comp ticket, but they were way up in the gods. You know, it was packed out. I remember texting a friend of mine and going like, Sebastian Funero versus Tim Zhu. Is selling all these tickets in Las Vegas. That's kind of crazy. Hmm. And and the the co-main event was Roly Romero and I I, I think and, and Pitbull Cruz. I was like, that's not a gr like that's not as good as the boxer card, which probably wasn't. Was the O2 packed out for? Pretty much, yeah. It was pretty good. The top decks as well. No, 
Right. So, but like this was like really like they had a huge big crowd at the team. I'm saying like the boxer car is much better and probably would have sold probably less tickets. So yeah, weird one. But no, Tim Su, uh, yeah, complete freak thing to happen. Um, but it's not like it was a freak knockout or something where you could immediately call for the rematch. He was beaten. And I, I think relatively well as well. So yeah, lots of, uh, lots of options in the division. So we'll have to see what happens next for, for both guys. So what, like, we got something similar in the UK in the former Hamza Shiraz, and he was competing at Super Well, but he's now had to move to middleweight now, and he's contesting at that weight. I just wonder how how much longer someone like Pandora he must really have the weight cuts and must be really disciplined outside of the ring to keep contesting at that weight, um, because it must be brutal for him to 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 get to there. But with those big fights, as we mentioned, looming for him. He's 26. So that's the sort of age where your metabolism starts slowing down and you have to look at kind of moving up weights and things. So I wonder how much longer he can actually do it. But with the likes of fights with Crawford and things that might materialize for him. Middleweight right now isn't the best of divisions with the likes of Canelo Alvarez having moved up. Gennady Golovkin uh, not in the frame, has kind of unofficially retired. There's opportunity there to do something and win titles in that division, but the fights and the fighters aren't quite there. The big fights, the big nights aren't quite there. So maybe he will kind of force and put, really push himself to stay at that division in, the, in that mix. And someone who might find himself outside of the mix is uh, a favourite for boxing fans, a favourite for Dunna Colby's Rolly Romero against Isaac Cruz Pitbull. Isaac Cruz, Chihuahua to Rolly Romero pre-fight. Well, the Chihuahua did come out in force and Rolly Romero, uh, uh, unfortunate end for him. Yeah, bro, it was an early stoppage. I thought Rolly was just about to turn it around and he missed the shots that were going in. So, no, I think uh, great, I mean, unbelievable performance right out the gate. Rocks Rolly early from, from, from Pitbull. I mean, Rolly Romero is one of these guys who I I can't miss him. I can never. I don't want to miss a single Rolly Romero fight. He, I, I love the build up. I love the way he talks. He's like if, like, imagine if um, who's that guy that goes to the gyms? Charlie Zelenov. He's like mm -hmm. if Zelenov could fight. That's what Rolly Romero is. He's got this crazy attitude about him. I was, I would have loved to have seen Rolly versus Ryan Garcia. That would, I mean, imagine this Ryan Garcia doing a build up for a fight with Rolly Romero. <laughs> it would have been nuts, dude. So yeah, I hope he he comes back and he comes again and. Uh, we miss him as world champion already. At least I do. Just going to arrest something in the chat. Jay Gibson, uh, you're very welcome to uh, call me the fake Coogan, but to be any ruder than that won't be accepted on uh, seconds out. So you have a timeout for now. Hopefully you can come back, do better, like Rolly Romero. Uh, we'll look to come back and do better. But Jay, for now, uh, take the what time the, out. What, what did they say? What, what rude thing did they say? Yeah, we'll come back to it another time. No, don't, we don't, don't need to come back to it. What did they say? Did they say no. something? Was it racial? No, it wasn't. Oh, don't okay. Worry. That's not that bad. Don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, no, Rolly Romero is an entertaining fighter, and he's able to talk his way into the big fights. He talked, Javante Davis said as much as well. He talked himself into that beating. And for a lot of people, he was beating Javante De Davis until he wasn't beating Javante Davis. So Rolly Romero, like you saying, is must see TV. But I, I don't know. It's, it felt like. Rolly, although maybe he shouldn't have been interviewed in that post-fight interview, as he was probably a little yeah. bit all over the place. Um, I don't know if he said he kind of retired. I know Danny's interviewed him before, and he said he's like retired right now. I don't know where they, where he is right now at this, this point in time. But one of those fighters who has those opportunities because uh, of the way he talks, he can find himself in one of those big fights. Yeah, and he certainly, like in all seriousness, he's a guy who fights. He's a guy who gets in there and and goes and does it, and he's, he's kind of one of these characters who you see uh, get in there and, and really he, he gives it his all every time, and he shows up. So, uh, yeah, shout-out to Rolly Romero, and hopefully he's back soon. I love him. Don't know, we've got a little bit of time as we close out the show, mm -hmm. uh, and we can fill that time with some of the Misfits boxing scene oh, yeah. chat. I know that you keep your ear to the ground maybe a little less so as to what's happening in the scene right now but what is the latest case with it and uh, in fact maybe this is a good time to bring in uh, the talk of mike tyson versus jake paul there were some rumors about uh potential rules that have now been rubbished by nikisa bedarian but it's a very strange move for jake paul 
who's been trying to legitimize himself as a boxer and has been doing so and got the favor of boxing fans by going with the traditional route, but then to jump back to this crossover fights and something of a circus fight for a lot of people in yeah. bringing in a 58 year old Mike Tyson. This seems a very weird departure from what he was doing and maybe in need of a big night, a big fight because the other fights weren't doing as much. Yeah, well, certainly it's it's a weird one for Jake. I just saw, by the way, KSI tweeted a, an April Fool's joke where he announced that he's fighting George Foreman uh, on Netflix, and they're going to wear, I believe, yeah, 150 ounce gloves, five second rounds, no knockouts, no punches allowed. Um, so obviously taking the piss out of uh, out of who Jake wrote that one Paul. for him? Oh yeah, I, I wonder. Who, who wrote that one? Um, I bet whoever wrote it, probably the, his girl has a girlfriend. So I think um, it, it was, uh, <laughs> I think it's it's a really weird uh, fight for Jake Paul and, and Mike Tyson to do. I guess there's so much money in it. And it's very weird that this could end up being like a revolutionary moment in boxing mm. because it's Netflix's debut in the sport. And certainly the eyeballs they're going to bring on this thing are going to be massive because all you have to do is be on Netflix, which everybody has, and just click. It's as easy as turning on the BBC or or ITV. It's literally an international version of like back in the day when you would have your your big NBC fight nights. Muhammad Ali would fight, or uh, Chris you yeah Chris Eubank Senior, and and all these guys were fighting in front of tens of millions of people. The entire UK was watching Ben Eubank, right? both of them, because they weren't pay-per-view fights. They were on TV. And this is going to be the same thing. This is the, the new age version of that where every... like, Do you have any friends who don't have some degree of access to Netflix? Uh, I'm probably the only friend that doesn't have a degree. Yeah. I was trying to get a mate to share their account <laughs> with me and they, they turned me down. Right, right. But I'm sure if you needed to get on Netflix, you very easily could. Um, and, and pretty much everybody has it. And, and it's in almost every household in the world, in the Western world anyway. So it's a, it could be like this revolutionary huge moment for boxing to have a broadcaster like that involved. But at the same time, it would only be a good thing if this goes well. And I struggle at the moment to imagine a world in which it goes well just because, like, I guess the best case scenario, I, I've talked about this to people before, if you could script it. Like, if you could script it, I don't know how you would. I don't know what you would do. Because as far as I, I'm concerned, like, you certainly wouldn't have Mike win because that's Jake's career in the toilet. And then I think uh, you wouldn't want Jake to just blow him out of there because that's that's horrible to see, like, a beloved figure um, from the, the world of of sport in general get brutalized when they're almost 60. Nobody wants to see that. So I guess if if you were scripting it, which I know they don't, and it's not, it's, and by the way, it's not going to be scripted, everyone. It, that's I hate when people do that. Every Jake Paul fight is scripted, except for the Tommy Fury one, which was real because he lost. All the rest of them were fake. When he lost to Tommy Fury, actually, no, that one was real. We'll give him that. Um, but yeah, I, I think... And by the way, that's who he was going to fight on this Netflix debut was Tommy Fury. That was the, the initial plan, but Tommy mm -hmm. didn't want to do it for whatever reason. Um, and I think if you if you could script it, you would want maybe Jake to get injured and Mike has to fight, like Jake breaks his hand or something. Like that's what happened in Rocky Balboa in the movie. Is uh, based on the line Dixon broke his hand, and that's how Rocky was able to fight him. And that's I guess the only way. Or or if Mike were to catch him with something and Jake were to get dropped and have to come back up and and come back from that. We need to see what the rule set's going to be. It's not this crazy rule set you're seeing on social media. I can't believe people are falling for that, by the way. The fight's in Texas for a reason. They're going to have a very liberal rule set, even if it's not a fully sanctioned professional bout. And it's going to be in a massive stadium. They have 89,000 pre-sale signups. Um, I think they're going to have sold out the AT&T Stadium, which is monumental, or at least it, it looks that way from the pre-sale. Um, so yeah, I think... Big night, big fight, but it's tough to imagine a world where it is good for boxing overall. Maybe we should get The Rock to produce the script. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Well, remember they had a script for the Tommy Fury fight? Oh, uh, apparently, yeah. That was, yeah, that and was none of it happened, and some of the stuff on there was outrageous. I think that people want to believe bad stuff about Jake Paul. Mm. 
So you can write something as insane as Jake's going to walk to the ring dressed as a baby. And people go, yeah, that sounds like a real script. That really sounds like the fight is is fixed. Like it, I, People want Jake to be a phony so bad. But in fact, he's not. And it, it, his fights are all legitimate. And this one's going to be legitimate too. We'll see how much of a contest it's going to be. Do you have any interest in it really? Like as a boxing fan? Probably as a spectacle maybe, but as a boxing fan, probably not. Well, this is where it's like, this is where it does cross over and this is where it does get attention. Like this is one of the few fights where like it gets announced and it must be on the news somewhere because my mum will text me as she did and say, Mike Tyson's fighting Jake Paul. I'm like, I know. How the hell do you know? <laughs> my mum's so like far removed from boxing at all. It's not in her feed. It's not in her interest at all. It's not what she watches on TV, but somehow she's seen this and I suppose it resonates with the laps fan to some degree as well. because she wasn't into boxing anyway, but she knows Mike Tyson. So it, it clearly does have that real appeal and could be one of those biggest events. But it's one of those as well where a traditional boxing fan, again, kind of really kind of poo-poos this as they probably would do uh, and looks at the Misfits scene and says, look at you now a uh, hundred times repeatedly as The <laughs> Rock did the other day to Cody Rhodes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like uh, it, it's a sign of the times when it feels like for me, the Misfits scene, the crossover scene is devoid of a big fight and they need those big fights there's only so much joe fournier's and phase tempers ksi can fight without fighting one of the big names of tommy fury and jake paul and if they're not in the dance they can't make those dances and it really kind of dries up they look for other stars like bazinga and joe weller that seems no closer deji's we don't know where deji's well whereabouts are so those danny aaron's you're not excited about danny aaron's versus bevo I'm not excited by Danny Aaron's versus Beaver. What about HS Tiki Talkie versus you? Yeah, yeah. He doesn't want that smoke. Well, we talked about Ben Shalom and I having a bit of back and forth. Then at the end, how about you and HS? You um, you're looking trimmer. You're looking like you put some <laughs> rounds in. It seems like you're maybe well, targeting I'd... a certain a certain uh, yeah. social media star. I, I've been uh, I've been boxing in the gym. I've been hitting the heavy bag and uh, texting you every round I do. I go, hey man, I did another round there. I got through another <laughs> round. Um, but no, I I, uh, I think HS doesn't want the smoke. Uh, he is bad at boxing. I've seen clips of him. Um, and yeah, no, look, the, the thing is, it, it was bad. That whole thing where like he was slagging me off and all that stuff, and he kept going at me on social media. I, the thing is, when I got home from Leeds that time. I went and my dad collected me from the airport and I talked about this with my dad. That's obviously not a luxury HS has. Um, so I, I just discussed it with my father and, and he basically just said, leave it alone. So yeah, I mean, HS, not a guy whose dad wanted to stick around. Um, mine did. So it's fine. Um, and we can box maybe if he wants. Some shots fired there too. And you keep firing those shots <laughs> at the heavy bag as I do as well too. We're probably better suited to behind the mic, I think. Uh, no, anyway. no. You, I've seen you box. I've seen you in the gym with Danny Gilfillan actually. Well, yeah. Uh, he got peppered uh, as he usually does. <laughs> uh, but he's in the chat as well too. And he can get it again next time we're in Manchester for Gil Barrett. Let's look forward to some of the fights coming up with Gil Barrett. The likes of... Taylor Capital, if that does indeed happen, the rematch between those two. But that's about it for today's episode of the Seconds Out Live. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for listening. Make sure you get your questions and comments in. We'll read them in next week as well, too. Uh, Danny Flexen should hopefully be back as well, too, after a much deserved break. Um, maybe Corby will be here in some form as well, too. Maybe in the chat, maybe we'll have him as a third um, third wheel. That's yeah, I, I don't like how like Danny wants nothing to do with me. He, I only come on when he's not available. That's not true. You've done a live with him. <laughs> no, that's true. I know. I know. Yeah. I really had yeah, the terrible when I was in my car. I was awful. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I think uh, I'm only coming back if Danny's on next time. And I, I like doing, I like being the host of this thing. Seconds mm. out live with me, Donna Corby, and your guest, Eamon Khan. Uh, we are on discussing Ben Shalom and Boxer and if it was a stupid question or not. But no, I, I like the hosting gig. I like being in the, the left side of the screen. Um, and I will be back whenever you want me. Well, um, again, for everyone tuning in, much appreciated. And as is customary, we'll leave the last word to the host, Dunner. And you can't say, what was it? Goodbye. Did you <laughs> just say goodbye last time? <laughs> I said, see ya. Um, uh, no, the last word, um, HS Tiki Talkie. Your dad doesn't love you. It's a good last word, right? <laughs> see you on the next one. <laughs>